So look, with recent news about Target losing $9 billion in a week after having a section for the Pride Month and the clothes and transgender, and wait a minute, what just happened? Why did they lose $9 billion in a week? Why did Bud Light just lose 28% of sales and it's not even slowing down and all of a sudden they're coming back saying, no, 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 we, we love our drinkers and we're not gonna do this Dylan Mulvaney thing. And then ESG comes out and says, oh, you guys had a perfect score, Anheuser-Busch, but after the way you handled yourself with Dylan Mulvaney, we are lowering your score and they're so scared. What happened to CEOs Number one customer being the buyer, you and I, then their employees, then the investors. Today, these S&P 500 companies, why are they so scared of BlackRock? Why are they so scared of their ESG scores? We're going to take a deep dive into that topic in this video. All right, so if you get value from this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Let's get right into it. What is ESG? ESG is a score to measure how well a company addresses risks with respect to environmental, social, and governance. Hence, ESG. Issues in its day-to-day work and operations. These risks include matters like carbon emissions, employee safety, and board diversity. The system uses analysts and algorithms to calculate environmental, social, and governance ratings that are then combined into a score. So where did ESG come from? In 2006, the United nations enacted the principles for responsible investment pri pri is a set of six principles that outline how investors can integrate environmental social and governance esg factors into their investment decisions the pri has been signed by over ready 3,000 investors representing over 40 trillion dollars in asset under management. These are the six principles of the PRI. Number one, incorporate ESG issues into our investment analysis and decision-making process. Number two, seek to ensure that our investment activities are aligned with our commitments to responsible investment. Number three, disclose our investment policy and procedures in relation to responsible investment. Number four, encourage investment managers to incorporate ESG issues into their decision-making process. Number five, work with investee companies to promote responsible business practices. Investee, meaning companies that they invested in into investee companies. Number six, promote the PRI within the investment community and with other stakeholders. So wait, UN as in like United Nations, United Nations? Yes. What what the hell does United Nations has to do with the way Bud Light or Target or other businesses on S&P do business? Well, this is how they have had the chokehold on companies to get them to hit a score so they do what United Nation wants them to do, which is what a lot of people in America are worried, saying, wait a minute, why not just worry about America? Who the hell are those guys to tell us how we live our lives, how we run our companies? That's what happens when companies become global companies. Some of these companies want more control. Let me even go deeper into how much control the United Nations, UN, has over these companies. So, UN has powers to influence the flow of capital and set international laws. Companies need capital. You have a high score, you get capital. You have a low score, we're not giving you the capital you want. Number one, legislative powers. The UN can pass resolutions that impose sanctions on or invest in sustainable development projects. Control. Number two, judicial power. The International Court of Justice, ICJ, can impact the rights of investors and ability of countries to regulate the flow of capital. More control. Number three, financial powers. The UN has influence over the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which have the power to lend money to countries and to influence the flow of capital. More control. The UN has several ways to influence these institutions, including the UN General Assembly and the Security Council can pass resolutions that are binding on the World Bank and the IMF. The UN can appoint representatives to the boards of World Bank and the IMF. The UN can provide funding to the World Bank and the IMF. The UN can issue reports and studies that can make recommendations to the World Bank and the IMF. So the next question will be, is there somebody above the UN? Who is above the UN? Who controls the UN? Well, let's take a look. NGOs have the most significant influence on the UN's decision-making process. NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Through lobbying, advocacy, and partnerships, NGOs have massive influence over the UN's agenda. They also have played a significant role in mobilizing public opinion on UN-related issues. The NGO that encouraged the UN to enact the Principles for Responsible Investment, PRI, was the United Nations Environment Program Finance Initiative, or UNEPFI, is a part partnership between the UN Environment Program and the financial community. So having said that, some of the largest NGOs today include Amnesty International, revenue was roughly $392 million last year, Doctors Without Borders, they had a $2 billion revenue, World Wildlife Fund, they have a revenue of $256, $257 million, Oxfam, $119 million, Save the Children, $950 million. And so now the next question would be, so who controls uh, uh, the UN NGOs? 
Now, who controls NGOs? Let's take a look. Top donors. So who are these top donors? Well, governments, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland are the top individual donors into the UNEPFI. So financial institutions such as AXA, BNP, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, ING, these financial institutions provide funding to UNEPFI through their membership fees and through their participation in various programs and initiatives. Foundations such as Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, these foundations provide funding through their grants and through their participations in in various programs and initiatives. You ready for the next one? This one's kind of weird. Ready? Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has donated billions of dollars to various NGOs worldwide and partnered with NGOs like the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and many others. George Soros Open Society Foundation, HRC. According to Open Society Foundation website, the organization has given a total of $100 million to HRC over the past 10 years, which has been used to support a wide range of organizations' work, including legal challenges to anti-LGBTQ laws, public education campaigns, about LGBTQ issues and lobbying efforts for LGBTQ rights legislation. By the way, if you're wondering how big Open Society Foundation is, which Soros gave $100 million to, he's given to them since 1984, $32 billion of his own money. Soros, his own money, $32 billion has been given to Open Society. It's a massive ran by George Soros. So it's crazy, right? You think about all these big organizations. Why, why do they care so much what these companies do? Why do why do they fear with this ESG score? Some? Why are they doing so many things that makes no sense? Why would Bud Light target a transgender audience? They don't drink your beer. You have military. Why would you make such dumb decisions? Because they're worried about pleasing the score. Here's a story from Bloomberg regarding BlackRock and Larry Fink. Watch this. In 2020, Larry Fink declared that a fundamental reshaping of global capitalism was underway and that his firm would help lead it by making it easier to invest in companies with favorable environmental and social practices. Our flows continue to grow and dominate, Fink said regarding ESG funds. On the same conference call with analysts, he added, BlackRock is a leader in this, this being ESG. And we are seeing the flows and I continue to see this big shift in investor portfolios. What Fink did not say is that BlackRock drove a significant part of that shift by inserting its primary ESG fund into popular and influential model portfolios offered to investment advisors who use them with clients across North America. The huge flows from such models mean many investors got into an ESG vehicle without necessarily choosing one as a specific investment strategy or even knowing that their money has gone into one. In short, an apparent BlackRock-led rush of investors into ESG in the past two years has been something of self-fulfilling prophecy, at least when it comes to the biggest such fund on the planet, a BlackRock exchange-traded fund that trades under the ticker ESGU according to data from BlackRock and Morningstar. So do you support ESG? You, do, do you watch this? Do you support ESG? Do you have mutual funds? Do you have stocks? Have you invested into some of these funds? You may not know, but a portion of your money is supporting ESG and you don't even know it. That's what this is kind of talking about. By the way, let me give you some numbers on how powerful it is and why company CEOs, S&P 500 CEOs, shiver when it comes down to these types of things. Watch this. Number one, Net Zero Asset Managers initiative launched in December 2020 with an initial group of 30 signatories. By the end of 2022, it had 291 representing over $66 trillion of assets under management. It's a lot of money, $66 trillion. According to Larry Fink's 2023 CEO letter, today's global financial assets total is 400 trillion. This is 66 trillion. That's a lot of influence. According to Boston Consulting Group, asset managers control roughly 60% of global investable assets. This is why companies are afraid of going against ESG asset managers control investment flows. There is no other way to say it, but why a CEO of a company that knows who 99% of his customers are wants to pander to this? Because behind closed doors, that guy is scared of not getting a good score here. How weird, right? Three companies I want you to know about, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. These three companies, the amount of power they have with ESG is wild. Here's an article from Harvard Business Review. Look what it says here. One of either BlackRock, Vanguard, or State Street is the largest shareholder in 88% of S&P 500 companies. <laughs> Let me say this one more time in case I said it too fast. One of three, State Street, Vanguard, BlackRock, is the largest shareholder in 88% of S&P 500 companies. Did you catch that? That's a lot of control and influence. They are the three largest owners of the most Dow 30 companies. Overall institutional investors, which may offer both active and passive funds, own 80% 
of all stocks in S&P 500 companies. The big three collectively held a median stake of 21.9% in S&P 500 companies, which represented a proportion of 24.9% of the votes casted at annual meetings of those companies. Now it makes sense. It's not these poor CEOs that were bashing and trashing. They didn't do anything. They're just reporting to their boss who owns 24.9% of the votes. They get to impact their waiting God, Imagine you're sitting in this board, right? And they're like, well, here's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about making something to target to get more families to come by and make a drink for veterans because we kind of want to do this. No, we're going to do this. And if you guys go against this, we can't fund your this. Oh, uh, what do you think? I'm kind of going with these guys. I still want my job. What do you think? You were with me when we talked yesterday at dinner and you said it was a good idea. I don't know what dinner you're talking about. I'm going to go. Why? He doesn't want to get fired. You don't think these types of things happen behind closed doors? What do you think? What do you think? When you have this kind of control, what do you think happens? You have to be naive to think it doesn't happen. These three firms control roughly 80% out of about $4 trillion in total ETF assets. So if they sold you and you're watching this, you're like, yeah, but Pat, the whole thing with ESG is environmental. Aren't they trying to make the environment, the whole purpose is to make the world a better place so the planet's gonna be around longer. No, isn't that what it's about? Well, maybe. That's what they say, but let's see if that's what they do. In December of 2021, Bloomberg found that only one of 155 ESG upgrades of S&P 500 companies cited an actual cut in emissions as a factor. (laughs) Oh my God, one in 155. But listen, ESG, what we're doing is environmental, social, and governance. We're trying to make the world a better place so you can last longer and live longer than your kids and the planet and all this stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. Show it to me with action. One out of 155. Yeah, you're full of shit. I don't believe you. That's kind of how the average person, after they look at the numbers, is going to say, I have a hard time believing these guys are doing it for a good cause. Okay, so, so, so as if this ESG stuff wasn't enough, have you guys heard about DEI or CEI? Maybe you've heard about it. You don't know a lot about it. Let's, too many acronyms. I'm with you, but let's, let's take a look at this as well. So, DEI and CI take over corporate America. According to JustCapital.com, as of 2023, 94% of employers and 74% of workers say that their organization has made a commitment to advancing DEI in their workplace. Compared to 2021, only 32% of companies required some form of DEI training for their employees. You're talking about 94% of employers, and just two years ago was 32% of companies require some sort of DEI training. This thing's becoming a phenomenon right now. It's cool to say we have a DEI and a CI training. I think we even fell for it like six years ago or five years ago at first, thinking this was a good cause. Okay, so DEI and CI take over in corporate America. There's a few things we need to know about. First, before I give you the stats here, which is absolutely wild. Okay, so DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Refers to organizational frameworks which seek to promote the fair treatment and full participation of all people, particularly groups who have historically been underrepresented or subject to discrimination on the basis of identity or disability. So, sounds like a noble cause, right? Now, let's look at CEI. CEI stands for Corporate Equality Index, which is the national benchmarking tool on corporate policies, practices, and benefits pertinent to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer employees. Which is kind of wild now because now with the CI score, if let's just say I'm a 22-year-old kid, just got out of college, I'm working for S&P 500 company, 379 are participating in the CI score, 138 is their first year ever. What do you think they're doing to employees like you and I for working there? What do I have to buy it for? What language do I have to use? What can't I use? Now, here's what's a little wild. When you think about social media sites for business, there's only one of them you think about. You think about LinkedIn, right? Even LinkedIn wrote an article about how this DEI could be a bad thing for business. Here's what it has to say. Seven ways your DEI initiatives are harming your company and how to resolve it. Number one, DEI is discriminatory. (laughs) Can you imagine? It is discriminatory. It's LinkedIn saying this. Number two, DEI unnecessarily preferences physical attributes over the non-physical. Number three, DEI diminishes the size of the talent pool. Number four, DEI decreases performance. Number five, DEI is divisive. Number six, DEI diminishes accomplishments and disincentivizes performance. Number seven, DEI is distracting, says LinkedIn. LinkedIn article, four ways to resolve it. Number one, close 
the DEI office altogether. Number two, eliminate diversity quotas. Number three, hire, promote on merit. Number four, seize all diversity training programs and reinvest that time and money to upskill employees. Little crazy, little wild, little dark, little no common sense. It just doesn't make any sense what these guys are doing here. By the way, do you know what the top five best ESG score companies are? Number five, drum roll, Bank of America. I am surprised. Number four, Salesforce. Number three, Microsoft, Bill and Melinda Gates. Anyone surprised? I'm not surprised. Number two, Intel. And number one highest ESG score is a company many say that supports the government is a company called Alphabet, hence Google has a high CSG score. Do you want to take a wild guess which companies have the lowest CSG score? These are anti-establishment companies. You think Tesla has a high ESG score? Can you imagine? Tesla does more to actually help with the emissions, but they have a medium score. They're not impressive. They're right in the middle out of all the automobile companies. Out of 81 automobile companies, they're ranked 41. And they're doing more than all these other guys. Twitter, not the best score. Fox Nation, Fox News, not the best score. Xerox, not the best score. AT&T, not the best score. These are at the bottom. I wonder why. Because they're not caving into these ridiculous policies that these guys are coming up with that cost Target $9 billion, that cost Bud Anheuser-Busch $15.7 billion. I tweeted this the other day, and I'll explain three points I talked about, about why this doesn't work. Lesson four, Fortune 500 company CEOs and CMOs. Number one, screw your ESG score. Instead, focus on keeping your best customers happy. Number two, you can't please both the ESG community and your best customers at the same time. Attempting to do so will cost you both. Number three, it's time for the board to fire the CEO and the entire marketing team. You know what the problem with that is? The board will gladly fire them because they're ESG people, because they own 24.9% of the board seats in the first place. Make sense? This is kind of weird to say fire them and don't fire them. They're probably not gonna fire these guys because they're doing exactly what they want them to do, but in an ideal situation of capitalism, not controlled by some UN PRI score, those guys would get fired. Number four, bad ideas have consequences, and number five, capitalism works, pandering doesn't. Either go into politics and sell your ideas, or run a company knowing your number one customer is us, then people that work for you, then these nonsense people out of UN and ESG and BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street that control you. You work for them and the world is starting to realize it. Don't you wanna be free? If you do, maybe talk about it so the rest of the world can realize what it's like to be so afraid, shivering of your ESG, DEI and your CI score. Anyways. If you got value from the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't watched a video I did on George Soros, who George Soros is, and another one having to do with Hollywood, both of them are linked to ESG. If you've not watched the Hollywood story of what they're doing with ESG, definitely watch this. If you wanna know who is really the man George Soros, click here to watch this one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.